Today, we are watching MCS Books talk about February, and more specifically, what happened to February. Yeah. There we go, that was the answer, really. He didn't do any reading. <laughs> right, hang on. I actually just stuck my little finger out like this. So that's how we, we drink now. <laughs> Almost went the wrong way. Hi guys, Dane here and welcome to Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. So for, um, well, what month are we in? We're in March. So for March, my March book was Trespass by Mikey Campling. So today I'm going to be doing a quick review of that and then flicking this 10 pence piece here to decide what the April book will be. I went into this actually quite excited because I know Mikey Campling, you know, as an author, he's a, he's a Facebook friend, he's a Facebook writer friend of mine. And, um, you know, we, we used to be published by the same publisher and stuff, so I was really excited going into this. And also, it says on the front, A Tale of Supernatural Suspense, which sounded good. And I read it, and it's not that I didn't like it, it's just that I don't think I was the right kind of reader for this book, you know. It was more of a just sort of YA fantasy and a fairly bog standard YA fantasy as well. And um, I don't know, I just, I didn't get absorbed into the story like I was hoping that I would. I was reading this on a plane while having a beer actually and uh, I read most of this in one flight. But I wrote a note that said it's a bit like Time Team but YA, which is kind of accurate in the sense that there is a little bit of archaeology and going backwards and forwards through history. Speaking of the backwards and forwards through history, I actually found those jumps to be quite confusing. I found them hard to follow. Um, and also, even when you could follow them, it felt as though something interesting was happening in one time and then suddenly you go to another time and it's just exposition and then you're kind of reading through it so that you'll understand when you get back to our time what, what is actually going on. Okay, so the blurb. Nobody goes into the old quarry. Nobody. Until today. Three parallel stories spanning 5,000 years, united by one deadly secret. Somewhere, sometime, the stone is waiting. Trespass combines the action of a gripping thriller with a historical mystery set in the ancient past and blends supernatural suspense with time travel. Discovered over 5,000 years ago, the Darkening Stone affects everyone who finds it. Jake was too smart to believe the rumours about Skader Stone Pit, but now he's in more danger than he could ever have imagined. In 1939, as World War II looms, the lives of two men will be changed forever. Over 5,000 years ago, a hermit will keep the stone a secret, but someone is watching him, someone with murder in his heart. But what will happen when these different worlds collide? How will the tales unfold? And when it finds you, what will you see when you look into the darkening stone? There was a bizarre bit right at the start where they're talking about this rumour in this pit. Basically, this kid goes into the pit, and I can't even remember why now, and then he sees some girls, and... Um, but he's already remembered that there's a, a story about this kid who got his fingers blown off. And then somebody says, yeah, you're going to go blow your fingers off like that other kid. That was too much for me. What other kid? I blurted the words. Oh, I. what other kid? I blurted the words out, surprised at the strength in my own voice. But he knows who the other kid is. And I think it's meant to be written in a way that sort of suggests he's being sceptical about the fact that this even happened. I mean, he calls it a rumour and all this stuff. But... I don't know, it was just, he just said, he it had just been said that this kid knew about this other kid, so it seemed weird that that was the way he reacted. There was some weird formatting as well, so, for example, if you look at this page here, I don't know if you can see, so there's a page number on one of the pages, but not the other, and then if you look at the indentations for the each of the starts of the chapters, it's like an unusual size, which I'm not really used to, but then you get to this next page, and there aren't any indentations at the start of the chapters. And there's no page number on this one again. And, th and then there is on this one. So it's a bit, a bit odd, to be honest. It made it harder to read. There's a bit where the character says, And I'd been wrong about her age too. Sorry, I'd be and I'd been wrong about her age too. She was at least three years older than me. Probably in a sixth form somewhere. Which makes this character... Well, sixth form is, is like 15, 16. So the character's maybe 12, 13. So it's definitely... <laughs> It was a YA character anyway, not even YA, arguably, almost middle grade. So, I don't know, it wasn't made clear, I was expecting it to be more of a, yeah, a more adult supernatural suspense, basically, so I, I didn't, didn't quite get it. The time hops as well, so I wrote down on a note there that it started to feel as though it was two books running simultaneously. Then uh, he meets, he meets this girl 
called Callie, and it says here, I was still close to her, leaning over the stone. I looked her in the eye. Her pupils were wide, glinting with mischief. In a movie, I would have kissed her. But I wasn't in a movie, and I wasn't sure if she was teasing me or flirting with me. But they just met each other. Some bits, again, the formatting was a bit odd. So you can see here, some of it's in bold, some of it's not in bold. And uh, I think it's to do with dreams, maybe, that he's having a dream. But then it happens here, for example. Slowly where Keen raised his head and some stuff happens. So I wasn't sure what the bold was about, because then it goes bold, not bold, bold, not bold. Oh yeah, then we get here, so this is about page 104, so we're about this far in. And basically he lost his phone in this quarry, but he's like, I don't want to go back to the quarry because weird things are going on, but I better go and get my phone. And I'm kind of like, I don't know, I think, as well for a start, I, you, if you leave your phone outside, it tends to get screwed anyway, just by like condensation in the air. And I just don't know if I'd go back into a creepy, like, dangerous quarry for a phone. But equally, if he didn't, the rest of the story wouldn't happen, so I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Then some more stuff happens, actually. And then he, he remembers his phone again. So we have here, uh, he's been running away from it. And then he says, uh, it was then as I walked away that my hand went to my pocket and I remembered. I stood still. Oh no, I moaned. My phone, I never found my phone. I would have to go back and get it. The promise I'd made myself didn't mean a thing. I would have to go back into the quarry. I had no choice. It just doesn't seem to be enough motivation for me for the character is all. The chapters are super small as well, so I've written here, you shouldn't be on chapter 37 on page 136, but yeah, how many chapters are there? It's 305 pages, chapter 74 by 288, so there's a lot of chapters. And that's again one of the problems with them jumping backwards and forwards is because they're shorter chapters. Though when they do jump, it's confusing because you've only just got back and it's just... Oh yeah, then we get to page 150 and this is the first time we go back to 1939. And that in itself is kind of weird because that's halfway through the book as well. I mean, don't get me wrong, the way these time periods tie together is clever. It's just, it's jarring as a reader to have to keep jumping between them. Yeah, somebody throws something at the bin and misses it. And, and uh, he says rotten shot, but he's 12 in 2010 and I'm convinced that no kid would say rotten shot Although Ron Weasley d does in the Harry Potter movie He says oh, that's rotten luck when the frog escapes from the train and that as well That kind of ruined the movie in a way for me because I was like nobody talks like that anymore Yeah, I, I, I just I don't really understand where the supernatural suspense came from as well like, it, it didn't, there wasn't much suspense, and there wasn't really any supernatural. You could maybe argue it was supernatural, but it feels like a bit of a push. I, I do think it's more YA fantasy, and that's fine if that's what you're expecting, but I just read Cassandra Clare and then went straight to this, and I'm like, oh no, too, too much of this. So again, though, a lot of this is the context in which I read this. I, I, I don't know, I was also on a plane, so I wanted something that would really absorb me into the story and make me not think about the fact I was flying through the air at hundreds of miles an hour. And I didn't get absorbed into the story. Every time I got near to it, I spotted something that made me kind of realize that it's a story, if that makes sense. A bit of kind of cringy dialogue between the characters, so we've got here. So, Matt asked, smoking, what's all that about then? God knows, I laughed. So again, as I've mentioned in previous reviews, if you laugh some dialogue, that means he was going, God knows! Do people really do that every day? Matt grinned. The double act was definitely back in action. Yeah, he replied, but the thing you've got to remember about cigarettes is they're just a nipple substitute. If you think that, I said, full stop, which shouldn't be there, you must have been going out with the wrong kind of girl. Matt had a glint in his eye. Sounds painful. That might explain why their bras always catch fire, he said. I suppressed a laugh. Either that or you're moving too fast. Some more dialogue that I wasn't sold on. A vault, I said, but they're underground, not stuck up on a ledge. No, don't be an idiot. A mozza what's it? I pulled a face. What are you on about? You know, like Lenin's got one. Sounds like museum. Uh, a goatee beard, a bald head, bad breath. Matt punched my arm. You moron, he said. And then it clicked. Oh, a mausoleum. Yeah, I think it was the even page numbers. They just weren't there at all in, in, throughout the book. Then we have a character who says, uh, Tore up the bleeding roof talking about his car but I again I can't believe a kid in 2010 would use the word bleeding I've never heard anyone say that I think 
And this is a British writer as well, so he would surely know that nobody says bleeding. Unless you're in, like, a 1930s movie or something. There was a good scene where he's been through a few bits and bobs and been with the police and this stuff, and it, his mum makes him tea and biscuits, which seems like a very British thing to do. I do approve of that. Oh, and then as well, one one thing I did re I did like was that he, w he says here, um, Maybe I could read for a while. I looked on my bedside table and pulled a face. I was halfway through of Mice and Men. We had to read it for school. Which, I read it recently and I really enjoyed it, but then apparently this character didn't enjoy it, so it just made me sort of like him even less, but... I picked it up, opened it at my bookmark and scanned the page. Had I read this bit before? I flicked back a few pages. No, I didn't recognise that bit either. I tried to concentrate and remember the plot, but I kept reading the same paragraph over and over. It was no good. I threw it back onto the table. Damn, I'd forgotten to put the bookmark back in. Oh well, maybe there was a film or a CD or something. But I actually said in my review of Mice and Men, I actually think it's one of the most approachable classics I've read as well. I flew through it, I absolutely loved it, it was hard to put down. We have here a strange bit where it jumps to then 2014, but equally, which is actually after the main bulk of the story happens, and this is where it starts setting up the next book as well. But also it's, again, it's not formatted correctly, it should have a, chap a, par a page of its own, I guess, if it's like the other chapters. Like the other, yeah, like the other pages and whatnot. He does say here in the in his afterword, lots of people love the ending of Trespass, some don't. I hope that the epilogue gives a more rounded feel to the book, but Jake's story was always conceived of as a trilogy, and it's very hard to tell you anything more about his fate without ruining the next book. But, I mean, I personally, I, I, I won't be, um, I, I won't be continuing with it, but, but only again because I didn't really know what I was getting into. And I, I just, it just wasn't my thing, unfortunately. Like, like, it wasn't a bad book, and especially for an indie release, it was pretty good quality. Uh, rating time, I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5. I, I just didn't enjoy it, and I, I wouldn't recommend it, to be honest. But, I mean, if, you, if it does sound like your kind of thing, and if you are into more sort of YA fantasy stuff, especially sort of British YA fantasy, check it out. Um, but yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah. And I feel bad because I like Mikey and he's a great guy and, you know, he should keep writing. I'm, it's just, again, I'm not the target audience. I'm sure if I was younger, perhaps, I would, would have much more enjoyed this. But, but yeah, one good thing I will leave you on that, um, about the author and the author bio. It says here, um, on the subject of writing, he says, I love the savage business of writing. It's edgy, exciting and much harder work than everyone thinks. Now we bring you the anecdote. Mikey has had lunch with the late Sir Terry Pratchett a couple of times, and you'd be pleased to know that Sir Terry was just as warm and humorous as his books. Okay, now we have the next bit, so now we get to choose what the next book will be. And uh, basically I've got a heads and a tails on my coin. I'm not going to show it to you because it didn't work last time. But basically, heads, we have Ben Sanders, and tails, we have Lucy Crookshanks. So, let's find out. Tails! So this means that at least my book for April will be The Trader of Saigon by Lucy Crookshanks. You'll have to keep your eyes peeled on Todd's channel to see what he picks. But uh, yeah, this is Lucy from Book Hacks here on YouTube. She's got a couple of books out and this is the first one. It's shortlisted for The Guardian, not The Booker Prize. I'm going to read you the blurb quickly. Vietnam 1980s. Propelled by greed, fear and hope, three desperate lives are about to collide. Alexander, a US Army deserter engaged in the dark business of trading women. Han, a girl trapped in poverty who believes Alexander is the answer to her prayers. Fuck, a businessman who gambled everything to save his family and must now pay his debts. From a society torn apart by war comes a heartwarming tale of salvation and redemption. So, uh, yeah, I'm super excited about this. So. Be sure to grab a copy of this if you're interested. I'll put below the dates that we're going to be reading it and when Todd and myself will be putting our videos up. But yeah, this will be our April book and I'm very excited. Please join me for it. So anyway, that's about it for this video. So thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Leave a comment to let me know if you're going to be joining me with uh, for Lucy Crookshank's book. And I will see you soon in another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.